Well, hello, everybody. So glad that you're with us wherever you are in these online days, whether you're in North Dallas or anywhere around the world. And man, wasn't that a great little like video? And, and I want to say to you who are Chase Oker, just way to go for making that happen and meeting, uh, helping to meet one of the biggest needs in our community so far in this pandemic. And it's been an honor to partner with YMCA. In fact, um, stand up right now wherever you are, if that's possible. And uh, it, let's just do the YMCA. Why not? OK, so here we go. YMCA. It's fun to stay at the YMCA. That's all I know. So go ahead and sit down. I know that was quick. You can rewind it, though, in this online era and listen to me sing all you want. Um, but it, it's a great example of, I think, what God wants us to do. And that is to look for every opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus in whatever's going on. And so thank you for stepping up and, and doing just that. And I want to um, say hello to everybody. Welcome you to not only our church, but also to this series that we're in. Don't leave home without it. Moving toward a new normal as we're trying to do that. What are the lessons that we need to take with us? Today is our last week of that series. Next week, we start a new series called The Secret Sauce, which is kind of the recipe for taking relationships deeper and uh, really looking forward to that. Um, but today uh, we have something important to share and don't leave home without it as we talk about seizing opportunity. So let me welcome you to this series and I'll welcome you to the year 2020. I know we've been in it a while, but that's the year we're in, in case you're wondering. In fact, at Chase Oaks, we're going to start a new service that um, if you get confused about what year it is, all you have to do is call the church and just say, hey, what year is it? And they'll tell you. That could come in handy. Okay. So, no, that's not why it's there. But the reason I put 2020 there is, man, what a year. I mean, who would have thought in January of 2020 that 2020 would have turned out the way it is turning out to be? I mean, I know most people, I know a lot of people were struggling with different things and it was, man, maybe a, a tough season or a tough year. But m most people I know... It wasn't really that at all. It, 2020 was looking good. Like there used to be a song, the future is so bright, I got to wear shades. It was kind of like, man, this is going to be a great year, you know, 2020. I know for our church, I mean, we were growing, one of the fastest growing churches in the country. We were, we had our finger on the trigger to start two new campuses and to triple the size of our family center and do all this stuff. And, it, and people were growing. We had lots and lots of new people get into groups. So just a lot of energy, a lot of momentum. And, uh, and we had no idea, you know, that what would happen when March came. I mean, I think that's true of a lot of people in general. They're in their business or job or industry or whatever. I mean, things were kind of clicking. And then, you know, and then March came. In fact, I don't know if you remember this series we did called Future Quest, Create Your Tomorrow Today. That's how we began. It seems like 10 years ago. But that's how we began our year. And it was such a positive, like, oh, man. And then March came. And when March came, um, you know, we we all of a sudden our life was kind of stalled or turned upside down or all this stuff that's happened over these last five months. Uh, people, you know, ran out of toilet paper. Remember that we uh, people uh, were furloughed. Maybe you were maybe, you know, job loss and business loss and all the stuff that has happened. And it, it's a, such a huge disruption. And, of course, there are other big things that have happened that have been challenging in this season. And it's, it's caused a number of people to ask the question, um, and I, I've gotten this question a lot, and that is, what is the, what is the deal with 2020? Like, what is, what is 2020, uh, you know, in this pandemic in particular, like, what does the pandemic mean? And I don't mean what does the word pandemic mean, you know, a disease that spreads throughout the world. But what does this pandemic like mean in a deeper way? Like, is, is God doing something or trying to tell us something? And, and one of the questions I've gotten is, is this a sign of the end times? Is this a sign that Jesus is going to come back soon, this pandemic? Uh, or other people have said, is this pandemic a, a specific judgment of God on America since it's hit our country so hard or maybe on the world uh, to get our attention. And those are great questions. And so let's think through those a little bit because theology can really help us. And, and by theology, I just mean looking at this is the Bible, what God has revealed in his word, the Bible, to see what can we know 
And it also lets us know if something hasn't been revealed, kind of what we don't know. What we do know, we can be confident in. What hasn't been revealed, then we have to be really humble about. So let's think about it through that grid. So is, does this mean that Jesus is coming back soon? Is this a sign of the end times, this pandemic? And, and could he come at any time? And, or like, real, like, is he coming this year or in a few months? And, and I know that if I, if I advertised and promoted a series or even just one weekend where I said, yes, this is a sign of the end times, Jesus is coming back this year, we would have a million hits on our website, you know, a million views of this service. That would be kind of cool. That's never happened. But I can't do that because that's in the realm of we don't know. Um, we don't know when Jesus is returning. What we do know from the Bible, it, it's a, a, a theological concept called the imminent return of Jesus, meaning that there's nothing that has to happen for Jesus to return. He will return one day and he can return at any time. Could it be this year? Absolutely. I would sign up for that. But we just don't know. We just we need to be ready all the time. The next question, you know, well, is this a, a specific judgment of God on our country, on our world? And and what I'd say there is, you know what? We don't know. It could be. But God hasn't revealed that. Um, it's always wise to pay attention to God and, and to use times like this to look to him for sure. But is this a specific judgment of God? I don't know. But here's what we do know from the Bible. What we do know from the Bible is that that God created the world perfect. When Adam and Eve, you know, chose sin and humanity chose sin, the world became very imperfect. Uh, sin brought in the curse. Sin brought in death and disease and destruction and injustice and all the things that we're facing right now. Things like pandemics happen in a fallen, broken world. God chose to intervene in his grace. And that's Jesus. He came here, took on human flesh, died on the cross for the sins of the world to make it possible for us to be reconciled to God as he took the punishment we deserve on himself so that all who believe and say yes to him can be forgiven and have a relationship with him. But Jesus also came to bring about his new kingdom, his new rule on this broken planet. He came to bring his redemption. And one day Jesus will come back. And he will finish the job. He'll make a new heaven and a new earth. And all that's broken won't be broken anymore. But in the meantime, he is at work fixing what's broken, redeeming what is messed up, bringing light to darkness and justice to injustice. And, all. and he's using you and me, who are his followers, uh, collectively called church, to do just that. We have this mission on this planet to join Jesus's redemptive work, helping people know how they can be reconciled to God personally and everywhere we are bringing his restoration and his redemption that's what we know and that's what we have to be focused on so this pandemic the way we've got to think about it is okay god what is the what is the redemptive purpose what is the new thing that you're wanting to do even in a season like that so that we don't miss the opportunity that every season like this, every moment, every circumstance brings, because every moment, every circumstance, good, bad, ugly, has its own uh, opportunity. And we can easily miss it. And I want us to be people, and I know you want to be a person who's not a moment misser, but a moment maker. That looks for the opportunity, has your eyes open and seizes the opportunity, joins God in what he's doing in your life, in your family, in our culture, with whatever's going on. Paul talked about that in Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, in the New Testament. He said, be very careful then how you live. And that word, be very careful, it's like circumspect. circumspect. It's, it's keep your eyes open, like be vigilant on the lookout. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. That even though the days are evil and difficult things happen in our lives, and some of you are facing stuff right now, he says, make the most, keep your eyes open to look for the opportunity. Make the most of every opportunity. Uh, that word, Opportunity is a really cool word in the original language of the New Testament, which is Koine Greek. Uh, Greek. The Greeks had two words, primary words for time, chronos and kairos. Uh, chronos is like chronology, uh, chronograph, like this watch. It's the linear ticking of time. Tick, 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 tick. Kairos 
is a different word they use for time. The NIV, New International Version, translates it opportunity, which is a good translation because it's the opportunity embedded in time. Because the way the Greeks thought is that every, every moment, every bit of time has an opportunity attached to it. And the way they pictured Kairos was as a winged creature, like in their art and stuff, you know, wings. And, and the winged creature would come with every moment and would land, just like, just like something, like a bird landing on this table. But just for the moment, it lands and then it flies away. And if you catch it, I mean, you only have a moment to catch it. And when it lands, you either catch it or you let it go. And once it's gone, if you don't catch it, it's gone forever. A Kairos moment. Um, just like this week, there's been some Kairos moments. I don't know if you know it, but this past Thursday was National Chicken Wing Day. That's a big day. I hope you celebrated. I hope you did it right. Um, but it was an opportunity because a bunch of places that sell chicken wings were giving away free chicken wings. That doesn't happen every day. And that's an opportunity, right? But if you missed it, you missed it. It came and it went. Or earlier this week, uh, there's this company called Kodak. You know, on Monday, if you had put every bit of money you could, you know, come up with and, and bought Kodak stock on Monday, you would have been really happy, especially by Wednesday. But because between, between Monday and Wednesday, it went up 2,500% at one point. Now, that was an opportunity that came and went because if you got all excited about it and bought it on Wednesday, that wasn't so good because it's gone down quite a bit from Wednesday to the end of the week. But it was a moment, a Kairos moment. And what Paul is talking about is in this world, we always have to live, not just let time go by, but look for the Kairos moment that's embedded in every, every minute, every moment, every circumstance to say, man, I don't want to miss, I don't want to miss the moment. Because every circumstance that comes into our life, every season of our life, good, bad, and ugly, has opportunity. God's redemptive work, God's redemptive opportunity. I mean, that's true of life stages that you're in. Whatever life stage you're in right now, some of you are single. Uh, some of you are single again. Some of you are uh, young adults. Some of you are students. Uh, some of you are married without kids. Uh, some of you are dating. Uh, some of you are married with kids. You have little kids. Some have teenagers. Some of you are empty nesters. All those life stages have opportunity to, to look out for, opportunity to seize. That's also true of circumstances. Now, it's easy, I think, for us to get that with good circumstances. You get a promotion or something like that to say, oh, man, this is opportunity. But what I want us to focus on today, since we're in a pandemic, is the not so great, the not so great circumstances, the ones that you wouldn't choose, that you wouldn't sign up for, the unwanted guest in your life, uh, where it just feels like your life is turned upside down by maybe sickness or a view or someone you love or a financial downturn or a job loss or you get sick or, or what we're dealing with. Because as hard as that is, and there are things to grieve and things that we lose in those times, there's also, for a Jesus follower, the adventure of saying, okay, God, I wouldn't have chosen this. But I don't want to miss the opportunity embedded, even in this difficult time, even in this difficult moment. I want to seize it. Because here's the reality. One way to miss an opportunity in the moment is to spend all of our time wishing things were the way they were before that moment began. I just wanted to go back the way it was. And, and we pout and we're upset and we just, we just get frozen. Holding on to the past rather than seizing the opportunity of the present. And one thing that I hope we learn as we go through this pandemic, as we enter into the fall, is to say, hey, let's not be people who just get frozen, get, you know, just wish it would get paralyzed, wishing we could just go back to the way it was, because that's not going to happen. It's a new moment. But in that new moment, even though there's things that will that to grieve that we wish were that way and and one day some of the things will be back again and that'll be great. But let's not miss the opportunity of the moment. And to help us do that. And we're going to learn from this guy in the New Testament called Paul. And we just heard from him in Ephesians. Paul was the key leader of the New Testament church. And, um, and he, in Philippians, it will be in Philippians 1, was going through a moment. Like, not a good one. Um, he was in prison. 
And not because he stole chicken wings or something like that. He didn't do anything bad. He was in prison for his faith because of persecution against Christianity. And he had been arrested in Jerusalem by the religious authorities there. And he was going to be tried there in Jerusalem. But Paul was a unique was in a unique situation in the Roman Empire because he was a Roman citizen. And not everybody in Rome in the empire was a Roman citizen. That was a, that was a relatively small number of people. And it came with a lot of rights. It came with a lot of perks. So if you were out in the empire, one of those perks was if you got arrested or something out in the empire, and you're like, hey, I don't want to be tried by these yahoos. I, I want to I be tried by Caesar himself. And they would transport you all the way to Rome and you, would, you could have your your case tried by Caesar himself as a Roman citizen. So Paul says, that's what I want. And so they do this whole trip to Rome. And this whole process takes a couple, like three years. He's just in waiting mode. And it had to be hard. It had to be frustrating. I mean, he's in prison for nothing. I mean, nothing, not doing anything wrong. And he's chained to a Roman guard 24 seven. Different a rotation of guards. I mean, can you imagine that? Like I, the Bible didn't tell us Things like this, but I, I wonder, like, how, how do you go to the bathroom? You know, when you're chained to somebody else, like, that had to be awkward. Like, hey, you know what? You look that way. I'm going to be over here doing, or hey, I may need your help in a minute. Or the Bible didn't tell us how he went to the bathroom, but it's not appropriate for a sermon anyway. But it just makes you, you know, just makes you wonder. But it had to be hard. I mean, who wants to be in that situation? Nobody would sign up for that situation. And he could have easily pouted and just wanted to go back and wanted his freedom again and. But that's not the way he sees it, because he's an opportunity Caesar. And here's what he says. Now, I want you to know, as he writes this church that he had started earlier, the Philippian church. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. What's the gospel? The message and mission of Jesus, the good news that God intervened in this broken world, made it possible for us to be reconciled to him. And how and how the gospel is also transforms all of life as God is bringing his redemptive work to bear. It's the mission. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Here's what he's saying. Okay, so he's in Rome. Now, one of the big things, if you're wanting to spread Christianity, is how do you get the message of Jesus, the gospel, to Caesar himself and to Caesar's palace? Not in Vegas, although that's a good question, too. How do you get the gospel there? But I'm talking like the real one 2,000 years ago. How in the world would you do that? That's the, that's the hardest place to reach with the message of Jesus. And what Paul is saying is, you know what? These guards that, that guarded citizens waiting trial for Caesar, they were palace guards. They were the same ones. It was an honor guard that guarded the palace. They lived in the palace. And he was chained to all these guards 24-7. He had a captive audience. They were literally chained to him. And God was at work in those conversations. And they're talking about Jesus. And they're, they're learning about God. They're learning about, you know. And, and when they go back to their buddies in the palace, that's what they're talking about. And Paul said it's not just the guards, but everyone else. Like everybody in the palace is talking about Jesus. How else would that have ever happened? And Paul is saying, man, I can't believe this opportunity. Would I love to get out of prison? Sure. But right now, it's pretty awesome. And because of my chains, he adds, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. There's Christians in Rome that were scared and weren't sharing with their friends about Jesus because of feared persecution. But because of Paul's boldness, he's like, they're not afraid anymore. And now all over Rome, people are talking about Jesus, and it, it's all because of this. Why? Because he was a moment maker. He was an opportunity seizer. And he could have easily gone the other way. He could have easily just pouted and just waited to get out and wasted the moment, but he didn't. He seized the opportunity. It, it's what a, a professor of mine back when I was in seminary uh, used to call, or the way he used to say it, is, uh, well, that's just part of the great adventure. And that was a phrase he'd use all the time. Like even if, like one time he was, uh, the bank had really messed up some stuff and he'd gone to the bank and it took forever and this poor lady just expected to get blasted by him. And, and he was like, oh no, it's just part of the great adventure. He's like, what are you talking about? So well, I'm a Jesus follower and he guides me into all kinds of stuff. And I never know why, I never know what he's up to, but he's always up to something. And here you and I are talking for two hours in a bank 
and I never thought I would meet you. God must have something in mind. And so I'm just always on the lookout for, okay, God, what do you want to do? And, uh, and of course, the whole story goes on. She ended up being really impacted by that. But other things happened in his life that were way more difficult. And he had that same phrase. And he would just say, well, it's part of the great adventure. I didn't necessarily choose it, but God, what's the opportunity? It's a very different way to live. I've shared before how a, a pastor buddy of mine, Andy McQuitty, who for many years was uh, the lead pastor at Irving Bible Church and still there in another role. And uh, how, you know, a few number of years ago now, um, he was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And it's not like he chose that. Nobody would choose that. But again, with that same spirit, he's like, OK, so now I'm you know, spending most of my time in chemotherapy labs or in waiting rooms, waiting for my therapy. And so, God, I didn't choose to be here, but it's where I am. And, and so he decided, well, there's all these people that he's with, same people every week who don't necessarily have hope beyond this life, who need to know about Jesus and his love for them and his hope for them. And, and so he decided, well, I'm just, instead of pastoring a mega church, I'm going to be the pastor of the of the chemotherapy lab, because that's where God has me. And, and that's what he did. And he would describe it as maybe one of the most fruitful times of ministry in his life, even though he's right in the middle of difficulty. I know for me, I've been thinking about this lately because uh, my brother is sick and, and it's caused me to think about my dad who um, a couple year, few years ago uh, passed away after a battle with ALS, Lou Gehrig, disease and that was a terrible thing we never would have chosen that but at the same time there were opportunities even in that difficulty and as i look back i mean some of the conversations we were able to have that we never would have had as i look back some of the things i was able to do just in helping my dad serving my dad would never would have been able to do and and you know it kind of crossed dignity lines you know where you're helping somebody use the restroom or helping somebody uh, clean up or whatever and it was awkward when it's your dad and but after that awkwardness was this awkward laughter and and beyond that awkward laughter was a, a way to connect in a way that we never would have gotten otherwise and and i'm thankful for those opportunities and those kind of moments i was just with a friend this week who's struggling with depression and and it's you know long going and you know all that but it's hard, but there's opportunity there, too. God is up to something. He's always up to something new in every circumstance. And what Paul is saying is be the kind of person that says, OK, God, what is the Kairos moment? What is the opportunity? That's true for us as a church, too. I mean, as a church, one way to miss opportunity in this moment is we enter into a fall, which is different than any kind of fall we've ever had. It's to spend all of our time wishing things would just go back to the way, way, the way, way, the way they were before uh, the moment began, holding on to the past rather than seizing the opportunity of the present. Like, you know, we're here we are in a season where we've decided to push off being able to meet in our biggest gatherings at our campuses. And we love meeting. We love doing church together. It's awesome. I mean, online is awesome. We, you know, you're doing that right now and it's a great experience. But, man, it's great to do it physically. And it was hard to say, OK, let's because of COVID and because of what's going on, we're going to push that later in the fall and and hopefully we'll be able to do it here in just a few months and it'd be great. And but in the meantime, and, and one of the things that went a number of things went in that decision. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can there's a video. If you go to our Web uh, thing that talks about our Web page that talks about, um, you know, why we did that. But one of the things I didn't say is that we. We talked to a, a number of pastors. I talked to a number of pastors around the country who they had started early and started trying to do church again. And most of those have stopped now. But, um, but you know, all of them pretty much said, hey, don't do it. Um, the most effusive, the most excited people were that had started back already were like, I don't know. All the way to deep regret as people had gotten sick and staff and volunteers and all that and but nobody was excited about it. And, and a lot of that is because of this concept of just what is the opportunity in this moment? Because there will come a time again where we'll gather together in our largest gatherings and that'll be awesome and that'll be great. And it's not that far away. But in the meantime, what is the big opportunity of this moment to focus our time and energy on? 
What is the new thing God is doing? And we can spend all our time trying to hold on to the past and miss the opportunity of the moment. I don't want us to do that as a church. I don't want you to do that in your spiritual life either. And so as you think about that, I want you to think about your life with God. Maybe your engagement if you're part of this church and of what it would mean to, in a new way to think about this fall connection to other people in a deeper way, spiritual growth, family ministry, racial reconciliation, outreach. We spent, as a staff team, this week, spent and all these different, split up the whole staff and all these different teams brainstorming. And it's not just brainstorming because we're going to do stuff. There will also be the teams that execute the ideas. But of coming up with all these ideas of how to, how to connect with each other, in ways, in small groups, and how to connect, do events at our campuses. Just because we can't do our largest physical gatherings doesn't mean we can't do physical gatherings. So what kind of, maybe once a month or a couple times a month at our campuses, what kind of gatherings could we do? What kinds of events could we do that are fun, that are impactful, that are meaningful? How can we do small group differently? How can we do spiritual growth differently? We talked about family ministry, kids and youth and parents and and man, how could we how could we make this fall maybe those most meaningful fall in family ministry for those with kids or for those who are students or those who are kids that we've ever had the racial reconciliation conversation in progress that is a cultural moment we don't want to miss that opportunity so how can we this fall take steps that way you'll hear more about that in, in a couple of weeks um, outreach opportunities same way. Um, and I'll get to the outreach things, but when we got to the end of the, this week, I was so pumped about the fall. Even though, okay, church isn't exactly the same as it was, and one day we'll go back and that'll be great. But, wow, it's going to be a great fall. And so many of these things, and just stay tuned, make sure you stay tuned to the website and all that. But all these things are going to happen, are going to be some of the, the best things we've ever done as a church the most memorable things we've ever done as a church. And we would have never done them had it not been for this pandemic, had it not been for this crisis. We would have just done the same old thing. And that's not bad. It's good. But God is up to something new. And so let me encourage you to dive into the new things. To, if you're not really deeply connected to other people, there's going to be opportunity. There's going to be opportunity to grow spiritually, opportunities for your family, opportunity to advance in racial understanding and reconciliation, and then outreach. Um, and, and let me just say, as a church, you guys have rocked it already on the outreach side of things. Uh, we saw the YMCA video earlier, and that just came out of talking with hospitals and talking with other people, just saying, hey, what are the biggest needs in our community right now? And child care came out. And we thought, well, how can we meet that need? And then we found out the YMCA was trying to do the same thing. Let's partner together. And we talked with them. And with that partnership, to be able to say to DFW, hey, if you're an essential worker and you're freaking out about child care, we'll take care of it. I mean, that's what, was, that's what we were able to do over these last five months because of your generosity and your faithfulness. Uh, and I'll give you an update about the YMCA. That's pretty cool earlier. Uh, over these last five months, we've, you know, we adopted five hospitals and came around them providing PPE, providing food, providing lunches, providing food for them to take home because, uh, you know, just to support them and, and what was going on there. Uh, their children also were involved in, in our the people who needed child care. Uh, we launched a Here for Good movement. Many of you are doing things all over the place on your own and in your neighborhoods and small groups. Remember the gift cards we gave out? A hundred, uh, we had, gave out a hundred gift cards worth two hundred dollars to just uh, people who maybe had lost a job or just needed a lift or needed an encouragement. Through our food banks, we gave out two hundred and ten thousand meals over the last five months. Two hundred and ten thousand meals. You've done that. Uh, our family center coming around uh, needs in East Plano has been amazing what they've been able to do right now, doing the school zone and provide. And you can go online and, and so you know how to participate that because that's happening right now. Just getting kids and families ready for school through pivot that we started to help people find jobs and be in, in, in jobs that are uh, sustain a living. Um, that's been going on and uh, been extremely active. The YMCA thing, the child care thing, I mean, we're doing that right now, but this fall we've decided at the request of 
our schools because this fall will be a lot about schools and parents and families and kids. And how do we come around our schools? How do we come around our parents? How do we come around our kids? Because it's going to be challenging and, you know, so for everybody. And one of the things that came out with from the ISDs was, hey, our teachers are focused on teaching other kids. And how are they going to teach their kids? And would you help? And so with the Y at our campuses, we're going to start a learning academy at our campuses for teachers, kids. And so if you're a teacher, you can participate in that. Your kids can. Uh, Or if you know teachers and stuff. But we'll come out with a lot of ideas about how we can continue to come around our kids and teachers and schools. Because it's the opportunity of the moment and we don't want to miss it. And there'll be lots of opportunities for you to engage in a hands-on way as well through our family center. We're, we're praying to go ahead and triple the size of the family center and add a bunch of offerings there to, to be able to meet the needs of people who've been hardest hit in this pandemic. So just stay tuned because it's going to be an amazing fall. And, and, I want, and we're going to pray here in a little bit. And I want you to think about, God, what is the opportunity that you want for me? Maybe in these areas of life, this is your spiritual life. Um, we're going to think about maybe your work life too. And we're just going to pray about it. God, in my work life right now, maybe you don't have a job or you're reevaluating. Maybe you do. And you're saying, is this what I want to keep doing? A lot of people are doing that. Or, um, you know, maybe you're, you have a business and you're trying to pivot and figure out how to, how to figure out the fall and how to, you know, just keep it going and, and whatever it is in your career or in your family life to ask God, God, what is the opportunity of this fall? As a family, as a married couple, or your friendship circle, or your neighborhood, or just in different areas of life. So here's what I'm going to encourage us to do. I'm going to, we're going to start with spiritual life, and it may be one of these things. But I want you to just, let's just bow our heads together before God. That's what prayer is, and just talk to Him. And, and ask God, when it comes to your spiritual life, just say, God, what kind of opportunity do you want me to seize in my spiritual growth this fall? Is it to join a group or to find some other way to connect with other Christians or, or to find a way to grow spiritually in some of these things that will come out this fall? Is it the family ministry stuff and growing as a family? And is it the racial reconciliation conversation, you changing my heart and growing the breadth of understanding and relationships? God, what is it? What is the spiritual growth opportunity that, that you want from me? And whatever God brings to mind, just say, you know what, I, I need to pursue that. And, and just, and you may not even know what they are right now, which in, because they're going to be coming out um, over these next months. But maybe just saying, God, uh, as those come out, give me wisdom to choose the right opportunity. Same thing is true in the outreach side of things. And then talk to God about your family life. If you're single, and just say, okay, God, in my relational world this fall, even though there's challenges in relationships in a pandemic, what is the, in my relational world, what is the opportunity you want me to seize? Help me begin to figure that out so I can grab it. If you're married, what is the opportunity in our marriage this fall? If you have kids, what is the opportunity as a family uh, this fall? If your kids are gone, you know, whatever, whatever stage you're in. And then ask God about your career, your job, your business. God, what, what is the opportunity of the fall in my workplace? God, how can I be your person right where you've placed me? God, what, what is it you want for my business? What is it you want for my career? What, just bring an opportunity to mind. Father, thank you that you're always at work. And you're always on the move. And even when something like a pandemic comes, or I know some people are facing things that they would not have chosen. I know I am. That are difficult and hard and heartbreaking. But at the same time, you're at work, even in those unwanted circumstances. And God, help us see the opportunity, the Kairos moment, even in those circumstances. And the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever it is that you put in front of us. God, don't let us miss the opportunity of every moment. Help us to be 
moment makers, not moment missers. Help us to be people who seize opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen.